I don't know about the rest of you, but I get bloody sick of hearing about the same bloody Super Nintendo games talked about time and time again on YouTube. Ooh, Chrono Trigger, Earthbound, Super Mario World, blah blah blah. We all know everything there is to know about these bloody games, as no one shuts the bloody hell up about them. So I thought I'd talk about something different. 50 great SNES games only ever released in Japan. None of this Donkey Kong Super Metroid bollocks. Let's talk about games which most of us knew nothing about and will make you appreciate the depth of the SNES library even bloody more. Before I get underway with this huge list, I am not going to do a bloody countdown like Watch Mojo and all those other bloody list channels, as there are too many intangibles to rank bloody games quality in my opinion. Instead, this is simply a list of 50 great games. So let's get underway! Let's start with a franchise which is extremely well known in the West. We only got Super Bomberman 1 to 3, but in Japan they got another two entries in the series. Basically, these games just continue to maintain the excellent Bomberman formula, which consists of great gameplay, great music and excellent multiplayer. These are another two welcome additions to the series, which are arguably as refined as Saturn Bomberman, which is perhaps the most celebrated game in the entire series. Final Fantasy V In North America, they got Final Fantasy IV and VI on the Super Nintendo, which were known in their region as 2 and 3, but they missed out on the fifth entry in the series. I have played all three, and each of these Japanese role-playing games are great entries in the SNES library. I personally do not feel that this one is quite as good as 4 and 6, but it's still a fantastic JRPG in its own right. Gunman's Proof is an extremely quirky Legend of Zelda clone, in which has many earthbound elements in its art style presentation. The game is set in the Wild West, and like many games on this list, it only missed out on a global release due to interest starting to decline in the SNES in the West by the time 1997 came around. As you can see, this game looks disgustingly cool, and it is certainly one of the many games worth checking out. Speaking of Zelda, Japan also got BS Zelda no Densetsu, which was a Zelda game exclusive to the Super Famicom Satellaview add-on. This is essentially a remastered version of the original game on the NES. It is basically The Legend of Zelda's answer to Mario All-Stars. A big twist though, instead of playing as Link, you play as the same main character that you play as in the Satellaview game BSX. This game was hugely popular in Japan and described as the biggest buzz of the summer of 1995. I assume the only reason we never saw this game released was due to never getting the Satellaview add-on in our regions. This wasn't the only Japanese exclusive Zelda game for SNES Satellaview in Japan. Ridiculously, there was even a sequel released to The Link to the Past in Japan. This was of course long before we ever saw a link between worlds on the 3DS. The Super Famicom sequel named BS Zelda The Legend of the Ancient Tablets has a brand new story set in the same world as its 1991 predecessor. BS The Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets is a wonderful second quest to a link to the past, as an additional fun and minor tweaks to enhance the gameplay. It absolutely blows my mind that a game like this has never seen a western release. It is the long lost sequel to one of many people's favourite ever game. Magical Poppin is a two dimensional platform game. The game is a side scroller which is divided into six stages. The player starts with three heart life gauge and one spell attack. The player can increase Princess's lives by collecting golden tokens, gaining one life for every three coins collected. The player can also increase health by finding heart containers in treasure chests. Spells can also be obtained throughout the game and are important for advancing further. Like all games on this list, it's extremely sad to see this one left at home. Bahamut Lagoon is a Japanese tactical role playing game developed and published by Squaresoft. Bahamut Lagoon combines an RPG mechanic with squad based battle combats. The game's core is turn based battles fought on a 2D grid, but the player can also explore his surroundings, talk to people and visit shops when he's not in battle. Game development staff included many key members from the Final Fantasy series of video games. In all likelihood, this was another game we missed in the West due to the game not being released until 1996. Front Mission is another tactical role-playing game published by Squaresoft. 
This one was released in 1995. Front Mission is the first main entry and the first entry overall in the Front Mission series. In Front Mission, players use playable units called Wanzers, a term for mecha derived from the German words Wanderpanzer or Walking Tank. In Japan, Front Mission was a huge success, selling over 500,000 copies in just the first week. Rendering Ranger R2 is a side-scrolling action video game. This is a fun run and gun game in which you play as a special forces soldier tasked with defending the Earth and its remaining inhabitants from a devastating alien invasion. You kill enemies using various types of laser guns in which you have acquired throughout this post-apocalyptic adventure. This hidden gem is extremely rare and it is a fault that there was only ever one production run in which estimated there was only to be a few thousand copies made. Umihara Kawazi, if I didn't butch that name too badly, is a platform game starring a 19 year old Japanese schoolgirl for some bloody reason. She wears her school uniform along with a bright pink rucksack. The Umihara Kawazi game's main distinctions are their tranquil fish and bird infested worlds and rope physics which define the gameplay. The games have simple controls and the girl is able to run, jump, climb onto ledges, climb ladders and crucially throw her fishing line. When thrown, the fishing line will hook onto nearly all surfaces within the game. When the line is firmly hooked onto a surface or an enemy fish, the line is able to take her weight. From here, Umihara is able to swing between platforms, lower herself down to other ledges and swing herself up to higher ledges. Due to the flexible nature of her line, she can also catapult herself great distances by stretching the line to a breaking point. The line can also be used to stun fish and reel them in and once reeled in, Umihara will store them in her rucksack and score points in doing so. This is a really unique game, and certainly one in which you should try out. Gambe Goemon, known as the Legend of the Mystical Ninja in Europe and North America, saw three amazing sequels in Japan, which I am gutted to have never received when I was younger. This disgustingly good Konami series features some of the best elements from Super Mario World, Castlevania, JRPGs overall and side-scrolling beat-em-ups. It throws all these elements together into one wacky concoction of quirky games. These games are both weird, hilarious and extremely fun to play. Whether you are playing as Goemon, one of these companions or controlling a giant Japanese fighting robot, you will always be having fun with these ones. Maybe this game was cancelled due to the storyline of the games revolving around defending feudal Japan from being westernised from the evil westerners. This series is pure brilliance! Sanrio Smash Ball is an action sports video game released in 1993. The game is a fun variation of Pong and Air Hockey in which players must hit a moving disc back and forth in an attempt to make it cross the opponent's goal line. As you progress, the game begins to switch up the gameplay each level by adding new obstacles such as more blocks, rotating blades and balloons, as well as having new layouts which either aid or hinder the players. Zigzag Cat is a puzzle game developed by Opera House in 1994. The game features a young hero and his shape-shifting cat. The gameplay is a mixture of vertical scrolling shoot 'em ups and breakout. The player can collect money which unlocks the various bonuses as well as Arkanoid style power ups that include a fireball that will go straight through blocks instead of being deflected. This is definitely a unique game which is certainly worth checking out. Zen Nihon Pro Wrestling 2 is probably the very best wrestling game on the entire Super Famicom platform. There is a whole slew of great wrestling games in which are exclusive to Japan which are also worth checking out. This game is based on All Japan Pro Wrestling and features the likeness of their most famous stars during that era. Following the template established by the classic video games of the genre, the game allows players to play as any of one of 16 wrestling stars and then throws him into the ring to fight opponents until one emerges victorious. If you're a fan of wrestling games, then this is one you must certainly play. Star Ocean is an action role playing game published by Enix. The game required a special compression chip in its cartridge to compress and store all the game's data due to possessing graphics that push the limits of the system. The player navigates a character throughout the game world, exploring towns and dungeons and interacting with non-player characters. Unlike Final Fantasy however, the battles in this one are not turn-based, but play out in real time. This is one of the best looking Super Nintendo games ever created, and a damn shame we missed it in the West.
Mario and Wario is a 1993 side-scrolling puzzle game. The gameplay of Mario and Wario focuses on guiding Mario, who has various objects placed atop his head by his nemesis Wario. The levels consist of various obstacles and traps, and because Mario has been rendered sightless, he is constantly in danger of walking into hazards. The player controls the fairy Wanda, who can protect Mario by changing the environment around him as he moves towards the end of the levels. Wanda is controlled via a point and click interface with the SNES mouse accessory, influencing objects on the screen when clicked. The game is entertaining, fast paced and constantly keeps you busy. It is very strange indeed that the Mario game missed out on our shores. Excitebike Mario Battle Stadium is a Satellaview adaptation of the NES title Excitebike. In this game, all human motorcyclists are replaced with Mario characters. The game has additional features to the original Excitebike, such as Super Mode, where the player has unlimited turbo, as well as the addition of coins. The coins are spread out on the courses and increase top speed. This game is bloody Excitebike with Mario characters, so it's worth playing for any Nintendo enthusiast. Fire Emblem is a series in which we only received semi-recently in the Western world after the addition of Marth and Roy in Super Smash Bros. Melee. As you will be aware, Fire Emblem is a fantastic tactical role-playing series and entries on the Super Nintendo are equally as fantastic as many of the other entries in the Fire Emblem series. There are plenty of great Fire Emblem games available to play on handhelds and on the Wii and the GameCube, so I won't talk about these games in any further detail. I just wanted to make you fully aware that there are another three games worth a look at on the Super Famicom. Gundam Wing Endless Duel is a great 2D fighting game released in 1996. The game is built on the same engine as Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Fighting Edition, but with extra improvements added exclusively to this game. This is a really fun 2D fighter and certainly a game worth looking at on the Super Famicom. Live Alive is another role playing game created by Squaresoft. Live a Life Story begins with a series of seven seemingly unrelated chapters that can be played in any order. These chapters are based on popular genres such as Western, Sci-Fi and Mecha. Each chapter has its own plot, setting and characters. After the first seven chapters are completed, the game's final sequence plays out, linking the previous chapters together and resolving the story. Live a Life contains the basic elements of a role-playing video game. The characters explore dungeons, towns or similar areas, fighting enemies and gaining experience points to level up. However, the game skews some elements typical of a genre such as magical points and money. This overall is just another great RPG within the SNES's library. Martian Adventure Cotton 100% is a shoot 'em up game. It is part of the Cotton series in which spawned many entries across various platforms in Japan. The Cotton games have helped to establish the visual style of shoot 'em ups, sometimes called cute 'em ups. Instead of the extremely stereotypical warships and battlefields you get in most games of this genre. Like most Cotton games, this is a decent gaming entry on the Super Famicom in which puts players in control of a witch riding on a broom, tasked with fighting through magical haunted kingdoms, yeah! Speaking of cute ups a bloody term in which I hate saying, another famous game of this genre is Parodius. Whilst in the West we only got one Parodius game on the SNES, in Japan they got bloody three Parodius games instead. These games, developed by Konami, are tongue-in-cheek parodies of Gradius. Hence the frickin' name Parodius, of course! The gameplay is obviously stylistically very similar to the Gradius series, but the graphics and music are intentionally absurd. These games are obviously ridiculously Japanese in humour, hence why we probably only got one Parodius game in the West, and even that was only in the PAL region. That's enough Japan for one day, I suppose. Tales of Fantasia is yet another Japanese role-playing game. This was the first game of many in the Tales series in which continues to go on to this day and it all started here with Tales of Fantasia. This 1995 game features all the generic conventions of JRPGs however whilst in battles the fight is played out on a two-dimensional terrain that usually stretches wider than just a single screen width. This is so the screen can scroll from left to right depending on where the characters and opponents are relatively located. Many Japanese people consider this game to be the best Namco title of all time, so it is definitely worth checking this one out for yourself. 
Rockman and Fault, aka Mega Man and Base, is one of the five Mega Man games released on the SNES. Out of these games, this is the only one that never saw a Western release on the platform. It is a spin-off title in the original Mega Man series and was released as far into the system's life cycle as bloody 1998. You can play as both Mega Man and Base in this game, like the title suggests, and the game has the best graphics in my opinion out of any of the Mega Man games on the SNES. It looks as good as a bloody PS1 entry in the series, however this game is more of a curiosity than it is anything else, as despite all of this, the levels and boss design just doesn't measure up to the other four SNES Mega Man games, but it's still worth a look. Treasure Conflicts is an aerial dogfighting RPG hybrid by Squaresoft in which was released on the Satellaview. More specifically, it is a Mode 7 airship dogfighting simulation. It is interesting that this fun, rather unique concept was never carried over by Square to any of the Final Fantasy series, as this would obviously have been a welcome addition whilst flying the airships around the world map in order to mix up the gameplay. A very interesting note in Square's history which is certainly worth looking at. We talked about Fire Emblem earlier in this video, now let's talk about a similar game, Super Famicom Wars. This tactical RPG was an early entry within the Advance Wars series in which we saw on the Game Boy Advance. Like the other games in the series, this game is heaps of fun in which you use military turn-based tactics in order to defeat your opponent's armies. It's always cool in my opinion to look at a series earlier instalments. Sengoku is a beat-em-up arcade game made by SNK which famously featured on the Neo Geo. The game however also received a decent port to the Japanese Super Famicom. Throughout the game the player will need to survive the hordes of enemies by collecting coloured orbs as power-ups. There aren't many decent arcade style beat-em-ups on the SNES so whenever you find one it's definitely worth looking at. The Kapati Hero series of games, known as The Great Battles, began in 1990 and serves as a crossover between Ultraman, The Masked Rider and Gundam. The series makes this possible by using caricaturised versions of the characters. The Super Famicom saw a whopping 5 entries in this series, all of which are exclusive to Japan. This series of games is fantastic and very Mega Man in terms of both gameplay and appearance. A great series of games which lasted a long time in Japan. I suppose we never got any of these games due to the fact that none of these characters received much popularity in the West. With the exception of Mars Rider of course for about a year after he appeared in an episode of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Who remembers that? Spriggan Powered is a 1996 side-scrolling shooter game which was also available on the Satellaview. The previous entries in this series were only on the PC Engine, so this was the first time it was featured on a Nintendo platform. This is certainly one of the better shooters in the SNES library. The pre-rendered sprites are impressive looking and the backgrounds are bloody fantastic. Check this one out. Gamper Deku no Gen San, aka Hammerin Harry, is a series of platforming video games developed and published by Irem in 1990. This Super Famicom sequel to the original games features Harry who wields with him a massive bloody hammer, in which you can use to pulverise your foes. I played this game in the arcade as a kid and I've only just found out about the name of this bloody game. It's great fun and definitely deserves a moment in the spotlight. Suti Hakun, however that's bloody pronounced, is a 1997 action puzzle game, once again for the Satellaview add-on. The player controls Hakun and attempts to gather up the rainbow shards distributed across each level. A level is completed when the player finds all the hidden shards in each level. Levels are arranged simplistically at the start of the game, but become highly complex and difficult near the end. The final goal is to find all the shards hidden in the game. This one's a bit weird, but fun and novel at the same time. The famous JRPG series Dragon Quest also received a couple of entries on the Super Famicom. This traditional turn-based role-playing game plays in an overhead perspective, features random battles and a character class system so that the hero and his party members acquire new skills and spells. The hero travels around the world gathering a party throughout his adventure. It is everything you would expect from a bloody series like this in which help define an entire genre of games. Marjul, aka King of Demons, is a pretty standard action game released in 1995. The game is often described as basically Castlevania with a gun. After defeating bosses at the end of each stage, a duel cycles amongst three different colours. The colour you choose will determine the type of demon you play as in the next stage. 
This aspect is a bit like the Sega Classic Altered Beast. Overall, the game is a bit easier than the likes of Altered Beast and Castlevania, but some could argue that that would be a welcome change to that style of game anyway, so give this one a play. The first ever Clock Tower game came out on this platform in 1995. Clock Tower is a survival horror point and click adventure game with 2D graphics. The player controls a cursor to direct the main character Jennifer Simpson and give commands such as investigating objects or opening doors. Jennifer is under the constant threat of a stalker named the Scissor Man. When Scissor Man is confronted, the game will enter panic mode. Depending on Jennifer's health status, she may begin to trip, slow down and eventually be killed. Clock Tower is an interesting game which features a haunting mood and atmosphere. It is also notable for the multiple endings and unique gameplay design. Do Re Mi Fantasy, Milon's Doki Doki Adventure, is a platform game released in 1996. This game is actually the sequel to the NES game Milon's Secret Castle. Similar to the Super Mario series, Milon can jump on enemies and stun them. This game is much more straightforward platformer than that of the original in which combined platforming puzzles and exploration. This game has a more light-hearted and whimsical tone than that of the original. This is a simple fun effort by Hudson Soft. Psycho Dreams released in 1992 is an action platformer which features fast paced action in which is filled to the brim with strange enemies, humongous bosses and massively chaotic action. Psycho Dreams is a very short game consisting of only 6 levels, however in an attempt to add to the difficulty each level has a timer counting down from 300. The actual levels are not too hard but the bosses on the other hand can be bloody brutal. Even with the huge challenge in the bosses, Psycho Dreams never feels cheap enough to prevent it from being fun, so make sure you check this one out. Super Dimension Fortress Macross Scrambled Valkyrie, what a bloody mouthful that is, is a 1993 shmup video game. Players have three playable characters to choose from and this is yet another smup that has obviously remained exclusive to Japan. Hence its inclusion in this bloody video. The Japanese bloody love smups. This one however was named their best shoot 'em up that year in which it was released. Radical Dreamers is a square soft to teleview game released in 1996. It is a text based visual novel in which the player takes the role of Serge, a young adventurer accompanied by a kid, a teenage thief and Gil, a mysterious masked magician. Ridiculously, this is the forgotten side story to the 1995 game Chrono Trigger. It was released to complement its predecessor's plot and later served as an inspiration for Chrono Cross. It features text based gameplay with minimal graphics and sound effects. Considering what a ridiculous cult following Chrono Trigger has got in the West, it is weird that you rarely even hear about the existence of this one. Super Genjin 2, also known as Super Bonk 2, is a 1995 2D platform video game. It is the sequel to Super Bonk within the Bonk series, and is the only platform game in the series never to be released outside of Japan. If you're a fan of Bonk, Super Bonk 2 is an absolute must-play title. It's the best Bonk title of the entire series, and easily approaches some of the best platformers on the whole Super Nintendo console. Seiken Densetsu 3, which sometimes we refer to as Secret of Mana 2 in the West, is the 1995 sequel to of course Secret of Mana. In the West we may have got Secret of Evermore, but in Japan instead they got this vastly superior sequel instead. The game is set in a high fantasy world and follows three heroes as they attempt to claim the legendary Mana Sword and to prevent the God Beast from being unleashed and destroying the world. It features three lengthy main plot lines and six different possible main characters, each with their own storylines and allows two players to play simultaneously. The game builds on the gameplay of its predecessor with multiple enhancements including the use of a time progression system with transitions from day to night and weekday to weekday in game time and a wide range of character classes to choose from which provides each character with an exclusive set of skills and status progression. This game is overall sheer brilliant and easily one of the best games to come out of the whole 16-bit era. It's almost criminal that we never got this one. Tut tut tut. So, that was bloody exhausting, 50 SNES games, aka Super Famicom games, that never left Japan. Which games on the list do you like, which ones would you like to play, and which games do you think I missed? You decide!
If you enjoyed this video, then click one of the annotations to watch one of my other videos. Shout out to Jarrett Tolzian, Bricky's Lad, Mad Ape Productions, Andreas Larson, Peter Sedorn, Diego Pereira, and all of my other patrons. Thank you all for your support. Yeah! And if any of you out there who's watched this today want to be added to my prestigious list of patrons, then check out my Patreon page. The link is down below. Ta-ta and farewell.